Welcome to this video run through of how to play the blockchain game with your class. My name is Scott Christensen, and I originally developed this game or simulation for teaching blockchain. I'm hoping that others will take it, make it better, and share it back out with the educational community. I'm going to run you through the basics of how I do this and give you some narrative and commentary along the way, as well as show you a little bit of the classroom experience of the game. I start out by explaining blockchain basics. I tell the students it's a distributed ledger. There's no central server or authority that can be hacked or that maintains this ledger that we're going to have this ledger distributed amongst different people in our network. And in blockchain parlance, we call those things a node. They're a node on our network. Every node and every person on this network has to agree as to how the information will be recorded. That's what is one of the differences between different blockchains. I then mentioned that a huge variety of information can be stored on the blockchain on a blockchain ledger. I mentioned that it can store financial transactions, and I usually give a couple examples there. Property records, once again, I can give some examples there about houses and transfer of property. Shipments and inventory. Is another example of something that a distributed ledger could store. And then I asked the question, well, why couldn't we store grades on the blockchain? So I go through this slide here, and I make it sound like a reasonable thing that we might do for blockchain. I mentioned the fact that all teachers calculate student grades and then enter the grades into a central repository. In higher education, we call this the registrar. If we're in high school, we might call it the central office. And I propose, why don't we just save some money and have the teachers or the faculty members maintain the ledger of grades? That's kind of the scenario here. It seems to work pretty well because students understand a grade. So it gives them a transaction that they're used to it. It also gives us a good example to look at at the end of the exercise about why a blockchain for grades would probably not be the best idea in the world. So then I recruit some volunteers. So first I recruit six quote-unquote faculty volunteers. They don't have to be actual faculty members obviously but these will be students that will act as faculty three of which are going to be nodes, and three of which will act as special nodes called miners. So I give each one of them a tent card and a special packet of information. Okay, so who's good at math? Who's, who's <laughs> bad at math? Okay, you're good at math, so you're going to be a miner. No pressure. <laughs> She's good at math? Oh, yes, yeah. And then? Sure. Okay. So the miners are going to have some extra um, work to do, <laughs> but they're going to get some uh, potentially some extra rewards. Potential. <laughs> I'm also going to give them uh, each miner some instructions, and we'll go over this in a little bit. So they'll get a special packet here. So this is our miner, uh, our other miner, and our other miner, and then. Here's our node instructions. I then asked for seven student volunteers. And then I give to each student volunteer a sheet that has a public and private key on it. Now what I do very quickly is I tell them that they must keep this secret that it's very important that this not become public knowledge, then they shouldn't have it out and look at it. And in fact, what they should do is they should 
fold this up and put it in their wallet right now. Then I mentioned to the entire group that the student identities are being concealed and what I've just handed out is a sheet that has a public and a private ID and that each student has a public ID that matches with that private ID that only the student knows. Again, this is what the students are given. So then I say that we are ready to start our first block. And this is the first block in this blockchain. So we have a student that has taken a Parks 320 course. There's the student ID and the grade that they received. So I ask everybody to enter that into their grade blockchain. Part of the packets that were handed out included a blank ledger for them to add this into. At this point, it's important to talk about this uh, hash that originally starts out here, the 212. I mentioned that we have to start somewhere, and because we are going to be linking the entries in our ledger together, we need to have kind of an anchor point, and we call this the origin block. And instead of looking at that entire origin block, in this case we're going to look at just the value of the last two digits. So in this case, 12. So I help them fill that in at this point as well. Then I mentioned the fact that miners uh, have some special work to do. So miners will solve a puzzle to create a unique number for the block. We call this a hash in blockchain parlance using the information contained in our block and they will use this to make our ledger secure. The first to generate a correct hash is going to win. Other miners and nodes will verify if that hash is correct. Then I give instructions to the miners to actually try to generate a hash. So I mentioned that the hash is pro comprised of a Nance plus A plus B plus C minus the value of the last two digits of the previous hash. Then I start to fill in what A and B and C are. And I mentioned that what they're going to do is look up the value of the first letter of the course in this table over here. The Parks course begins with a P. So the first letter, looking up in this table, will equal 80. Value of the first letter of the student public key. What was an A? The student uh, public key started with an A. So we put 65. And then C is the value of the grade, in this case an F, which is 70. For those of you that have a little computer science background or uh, took a computing course at some point may recognize this as the American Standard Code or ASCII table. The Nance is a value that they're going to have to find. It's somewhere between 1 and 3 that they will adjust to calculate a hash that can be equally divisible by 3. So the rule for our hash is that it has to be divisible by 3. So at this point, they have all this information here, and it's up to the miners to start mining. I give them this miner worksheet that helps them uh, calculate this out quickly if they would like. Um, most students that are a little bit mathematically inclined don't really need this. They can figure it out pretty quick. Once we start mining, I then wait until someone thinks they have a correct hash. Usually what they do is they an announce what the Nance is, not the hash value. So once that happens, I tell all the other miners and the nodes that we're going to now verify if that is correct. So there's been a declaration that this is correct, and we will uh, verify that. Gotcha. It's like 
it would be one. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we have minor number three has saying is saying that it's one. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, minor number three says it's one. I would like the other minors and the other nodes to see if you can verify this, and we will vote on it. Okay, so we have two. Two yeses. Two yeses, any no's? Let me know your results as soon as you get them. So you got one. So we have three. It's at fifty percent right now. And you say one. Okay, we're now done. We have achieved over fifty-one percent of the vote, and therefore we're going to declare that this block is complete. Once we've voted, we can now have all of our nodes fill in the values for our first block. We also want to give a little reward to the miner that figured out this hash. Yeah. Thank you. All right, very good. Well, that miner did a great job. And so this miner gets a water bottle. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, it's a reward. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. For doing all that hard work. All right, well, so we have our first block. We then go through and keep on doing this. The first couple blocks are going to be slow and you might have to help them a little bit, but it will speed up fairly quickly. The miners do their mining, we verify and vote, and then we have another block. Here's the next, the third grade, the miners mine, we verify and vote, keep on moving on. It doesn't take too long to get to six blocks. At this point, I think the point has been driven home that the miners are doing some work and during the class I say this miner has a proof of their work. Usually when I'm awarding them the prize for completing that work. And so they are starting to get an idea of what's going on. I also use the word consensus. Once we have gotten to that 51 percent, we've stopped voting at that point because it doesn't matter anymore because that's our threshold for determining whether this is a correct block. We then uh, say that we have consensus. So you try to use that word consensus throughout the exercise as well. Then we can stop and we can start to ask the entire class some questions. So I'll ask them what course did this particular student take and what grade did they earn? So they can look on there and they can say oh well it was business 200 and they got a C. So that illustrates then that here is a ledger that even though we are not a node on we can in fact interrogate and view. And in that point you might want to switch over to either scan or one of the other um, block or Bitcoin scanning uh, web pages uh, and actually look at some of those transactions. And you can see that here are transactions that are occurring. And just like the student name is obfuscated by this public key, likewise, we see the public keys there for what's going on. We can also then call on a student and ask them um, what grade they received. So we can ask student 7 to get that out of their wallet to take a look and see where they are on this blockchain and what grade they received. We can then have some what ifs. So what if we change block 1? So for example, we wanted this student now to have an A or the student wanted to somehow change or hack the blockchain and change it to an A. At this point I would bring up the Excel version of the ledger. I would switch to the grades tab. So right over here is 
the worksheet that we printed out for the miners and nodes. Here's the actual ledger as it's going to play out. And I would show them that if I change this grade to an A, that that's going to change all the hashes. It's going to make it no longer a valid hash. And it's also um, going to screw up any subsequent hashes. I also might show that if I change any aspect of the data, including the student, or if I actually uh, change the course, um, that is also going to affect the entire chain. And we would have to then recalculate, if we did make this change, somebody would have to recalculate the Nance, then they would have to um, keep on going and do all these calculations in order to kind of catch up or to be able to submit some hash that might be correct for subsequent blocks. Uh, so you can delve into this more about how you might actually attack um, the blockchain and about how difficult that would be because of the relationship from one block to the next. We can also ask some what if questions about what happens if a grade is announced by someone other than a faculty member. So we can talk about electronic signatures and that being signed uh, as a valid um, transaction. Uh, what if a student pays off a node to record an A for their grade? So you can slip one of the faculty members a dollar, uh, the quote-unquote faculty members in this exercise a dollar, and see if they will make a change. Of course, what happens is when it goes to vote, everybody's going to vote down that hash. I then take, um, ask one of the students that's there, uh, usually student number five, and I ask them to provide me with that sheet, and I tear it up. And uh, then their private key is lost, and they cannot figure out what their grade was or what course they took in this ledger, or at least they can't prove it. And we talk about the fact that uh, people have lost their Bitcoin wallets or their Thridium uh, wallets and how they're out in landfills trying to find these things. And that's why um, you hear about these types of stories. So we can also talk about um, well, I think we already went through this one. A miner changes the transaction. That's kind of the same thing if um, somebody was to bribe a miner. And uh, this next one here is interesting. The difficulty of calculating a hash increases as the blockchain grows. I originally set this game so that it had the hash had to be divisible by 3 and by 2. I found with some audiences that didn't really work. That was just a little bit too much. But if you were doing this uh, in advanced engineering school and you wanted to really make it difficult, you could uh, start out making it divisible by two for a couple blocks, and then it had to be divisible by two and by three, and then by two and by three and by five, and you could keep on increasing the criteria for that hash as the blockchain grew. I then go through and look at what we observed in this game and making sure that all the students understand um, that we have observed all of these different things throughout the game. Then it's a good time to mention the fact that it's a bad idea to store grades on a blockchain and that there are in fact ways to figure out what are good applications for blockchain. I usually go through this one from the uh, Department of Homeland Security and I show that, in fact, the best thing to do would be to store a gray database in a centralized encrypted database. And that seems to um, make sense to students uh, at that time. So that is a walkthrough of this game. I'm very interested to hear how it works for you. I've been surprised about how well it's worked for me so far. And so I look forward to your input, to your modifications, and any corrections that you might have. 
and I should say that uh, everything in here is either created by me or is uh, the, some of the graphics were from uh, Pixabay and those are a public domain uh, documents. Thank you for watching.